on to the uh, the plenary talk, the keynote address uh, by um, Dr. Jack Halberstam. This is for uh, the Lavender Languages and Linguistics 27th Conference. Um, it's May 23rd, 2021. My name is Michelle Marzullo, and I'm um, the chair and um, professor in the Human Sexuality PhD department at the California Institute of Integral Studies, CIIS, in San Francisco, California. And um, we've had the pleasure to host the Lavender Languages Conference this year um, after having postponed um, the conference due to COVID-19 in 2020. So um, very grateful for the Lavender Languages community for showing up and most grateful for Jack Helberstam for agreeing twice to um, do this um, keynote address with us. Um, and so I'd like to uh, start us off um, by introducing um, Dr. Halberstam, um, and uh, who will be giving a talk uh, entitled on destitution, dereliction, depreciation, and dispossession. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce um, you, um, Dr. Halberstam. Um, Dr. Halberstam is a professor of gender studies and English at Columbia University in New York, New York. Um, Places Journal awarded Halberstam its Arcus Places Prize in 2018 for innovative public scholarship on the relationship between gender, sexuality, and the built environment. Halberstam is a prolific author and um, academic and public academic, um, authoring seven books, including Skin Shows, Gothic Horror, and the Technology of Monsters from Duke, 1995, Female Masculinity, Duke, 1998, In a Queer Time and Place, NYU Press, 2005, The Queer Art of Failure, Duke, 2011, Gaga Feminism, Sex, Gender, and the End of Normal, um, Beacon Press 2012, a short book titled Trans, A Quick and Quirky Account of Gender Variance, University of California Press 2018, and most recently, Wild Things, The Disorder of Desire um, by Duke 2020. And um, they're currently working on a companion volume titled The Wild Beyond Art, Architecture, and Anarchy. Uh, sounds great. Um, in reviewing Wild Things, uh, Tal Melvina of the Nation um, calls Halberstam a radical social thinker, uh, and I tend to agree. Um, reviews of the new work articulate the concept wild as a way to help dismantle our unjust world. In Wild Things, Halberstam offers an alter alternative history of sexuality by tracing the ways in which wildness has been associated with queerness and queer bodies throughout the 20th century. Halberstam theorizes the wild as an unbounded, unpredictable space that offers sources of opposition to modernity's orderly impulses. Wildness illuminates the normative taxonomies of sexuality against which radical queer practice and politics operate. Throughout, Halberstam engages with a wide variety of texts, practices, and cultural imaginaries from zombies, falconry, and N. Norby Say Phillips Zong. Um, you'll have to correct my pronunciation on that, Dr. Halberstam. Um, to Maurice Sendak's Where the Wild Things Are and the career of Irish anti-colonial revolutionary Roger Casement to demonstrate how wildness provides the means to know and be in ways that transgress Euro-American notions of the modern liberal subject. With wild things, Halberstam opens new possibilities for queer theory and for wild thinking more broadly. In the nation piece, Milvina goes on to say, um, that Wild Things argues, quote, that our environmental and carceral crises trace back 
just six centuries, a European conquest altered our climate. The state legitimized its violence through colonial ideas of the wild, quote, savage otherness, unspoiled nature, and the intuitive connection to Black criminality. Living in the ruins of genocide and slavery, Halberstam argues that we must remake everything. Wild things is a deconstruction of the colonial logics of the wild and a reconstruction of the term itself. In their 2016 article, When Sex and Power Collide, an argument for critical sexuality studies, Brianna Foz and Sarah I. McClelland, a notable CIS grad, argues that there is a guiding framework that may be used to both construct and understand critical sexuality studies, given that the old notions, sex, sexual identity, gender identity, can no longer simply be relied upon as anchors for doing this work. Instead, they argue that a tripartite analytic structure of one conceptual analysis with particular attention to how we define key terms and conceptually organize our research, for example, around concepts such as attraction, desire, consent, and now thanks to Halberstam wildness. Number two, we can use attention to the material qualities of abject bodies, particularly bodies that are ignored, overlooked, and pushed out of bounds, viscous bodies, fat bodies, bodies in pain. And number three, heteronormativity and heterosexual privilege might focus our research, particularly how assumptions about heterosexuality and heteronormativity circulate in sexuality research. This framework certainly helps to anchor the critical sexuality studies we're doing in our doctoral program at CIAS. And the one that I describe in a forthcoming edited volume called Critical Sexual Literacy, Forecasting Trends in Sexual Politics, Diversity, and Pedagogy. Indeed, Halberstam's body of work over the past three decades has helped to establish the field of critical sexuality studies with their signature focus on subjugated knowledge or the things that our society largely disc discards and discounts, including low rather than high culture. Halberstam's genius is in drawing our attention to disparate groupings of materials and happenings across place and time to focus us on such critical sexuality studies, concepts and concerns that are works that are for many of us, um, not merely theoretical or academic, but literally life and death and in some ways revelatory and celebratory, a way towards a kind of freedom I'm sure that the discussion today will be similarly enlivening and crucial. So please join me, everyone, in welcoming Jack Halberstam. Welcome, Jack. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. That was a beautiful introduction. And uh, I'm super excited to be with you this evening. And uh, congratulations to everyone who attended the conference and presented. Um, this, uh, I know that this conference has taken a lot of planning. So I know we're all happy to be here. Okay, so um, my title is not uh, the title that I had given Michelle, uh, given that we are a year away from, you know, when I originally started thinking about attending uh, Lavender uh, Languages, I um, decided that what I wanted to do today was try to talk with you about a new vocabulary for thinking about social change. So we're very stuck in some ways in a vocabulary that we have inherited from capitalism. And that vocabulary, which is oriented towards voting, democracy, building, uh, making, doing, is a vocabulary that is absolutely embedded in concepts of uh, ownership and profit. So in order to move into a different kind of phase politically and economically, uh, we need different vocabularies. And I, I know that as a group and as a, um, an organization, you think a lot about language and about how we communicate with each other. And uh, honestly, we, we are not going to be able to really bring about massive social change until the structures with which we think um, 
change completely and change with us. So what I'm going to do today is try to uh, offer in place of the language of improvement and making, I'm going to offer an aesthetics of collapse. So let me share screen with you so that we can go to my keynote presentation. I'm going to go into play and okay, not, not yet because we're on the wrong slide. Here you go. Now you can see what I mean, an aesthetics of collapse. And it'll become really quick, clear and queer very quickly uh, why I'm um, asking us to think about collapse. And I'm gonna start with a quote from Ursula Le Guin, excuse the misspelling in Ursula's name, um, from a novel that we're gonna to return to at the very end of the talk. And that's The Dispossessed, uh, which I believe was published originally in 1973. In The Dispossessed, her main character, Shevik, says, and this, by the way, Shevik is an anarchist scientist living on an anarchist planet, which is in relationship to a capitalist planet. And his anarchist society has split away from that capitalist society and they live separately. So this is the kind of anarchist principle that we wanna work through today using the language of collapse. So Shevik says, those who build walls are their own prisoners. I'm going to fulfill my proper function in the social organism. I am going to unbuild walls. Okay, so that's our goal tonight is to think about collapse, to think about unbuilding the world, and to think about how collapse could be useful to us in an era of global pandemic when viruses have been able to leap from animals to humans precisely because we have trespassed on animal habitats and terrains. It's also a moment within which we see a shocking rise of right-wing authoritarianism that is consolidating capitalism rather than you know, changing its framework in any way, shape or form. Um, and we are also subject to forms of capitalism that are not at all compatible to what we've been calling democracy. Something like predatory lending, which as you know, brought about the last uh, economic crisis is now so endemic through the system, these kinds of practices that there is no possibility for equality of any kind or even opportunity for massive numbers of people uh, within capitalism. So under those conditions, it seems to me that we no longer want to think in terms of world building. And world building has been the language for a whole generation of queer studies. And the people who I would uh, reference here include Jose Munoz, uh, and his mentor, Eve Sedgwick, both of whom uh, allied themselves with utopian projects built around the concept of world making. And that that's really understandable uh, in terms of, you know, thinking about the 1990s when, 1980s and 90s, when people were coming out into a hostile straight world and needed to invest in making queer worlds visible and tangible and legitimate. But we're not in that era anymore. We're in an era when we have to actually think about the possibilities of unmaking life as we know it. And this is just an image from New York City in the 1970s. And um, I'll come back to uh, these kinds of uh, ruins uh, in a moment. Okay, this is an image um, by a, an African-American photographer called Alvin Baltrop. And he um, made lots of photographs like this one that we're gonna talk about this evening in which he was there ostensibly to photograph men having sex in the piers. And the piers in New York City in the 1970s and 80s were falling apart in the wake of uh, post-industrial collapse. Um, and so these piers that had once received ocean liners and trade vessels uh, were now not used for anything much anymore other than gay male cruising, drug dealing, uh, um, homeless people would sleep there. And as you can see, the piers were slowly um, and inexorably collapsing. Alvin Baltrop is known mostly for his photographs of gay men. And even in this photograph, which, which will orient you towards his photography, which we'll leave and then come back to. But I want you to look in the very middle of this photograph. Uh, 
In the middle of the photograph, there's a very small image of two men having sex. And it's so small, you can only see it by sort of looking at the very, very center of the photograph and seeing that there are two sort of white, light, maybe flesh-like uh, structures there. That's two men having sex. And this is his signature. Uh, Baltrop would take images that were mostly of the collapsing building and the relationship of that collapsing building to the water. And there was often also a sense of the sort of the polluted air. And you can see all of those things in this uh, photograph. And in the middle of all of this ruination and collapse, you will see two gay men having sex. Some of the reasons that his gay male figures are so small is that he was at a large distance from them and he was probably not carrying fancy camera equipment. So he didn't have the biggest zoom lens that would take you into a kind of pornographic uh, proximity to the couple. But this then lends the photographs a new um, sense of scale, a new sense of scale in the sense that because this is a photograph of two men having sex, if we were any closer, it would be very hard for us to look at anything else. But because the gay men are so diminutive, our eyes are trained clearly upon the collapsing building. And through this method, I'm going to argue that Alvin Baltrop laid out an aesthetics and an erotics of collapse. We'll return to his work in a moment. There's lots to say about collapse. Um, collapse names um, uh, an aesthetic. Um, I'm gonna say an aesthetic that sets itself up against improvement an aesthetic that allows us to see the beauty of gradual and inevitable decay. And it is an aesthetic that also is able to comment on growing forms of gentrification on the one hand and the demolition of public housing on the other. This image that you're looking at is from 1993. It is by, um, uh, oh, do I have the image? No, this is uh, by, uh, White Reed, um, who was White Reed, who was a who is a uh, British artist, and what she did with this sculpture was she cast a plaster cast of the interior of a house that was slated uh, for demolition. Rachel White Reed, that's her name. Um, so the house was slated for demolition. It was in a part of the city of London, Miles End, where there were many, many public um, housing projects low-income housing for working class people that were crumbling, that were not being fixed up, and that many of them were slated for demolition. She decided to make a kind of tribute, if you like, to the housing project, but also to um, domestic interiority. So she very elaborately cast this, uh, this plaster cast of the interior of the house and then dismantled the whole house around it leaving only a shape of the inside. And that's what you're looking at. You're literally looking at the shape of a domestic interior. Um, and you're looking at the absence um, in the place of where a building would have been. So collapse orients us to look at what is not there, but to also look at the shape of negative space and to think with these kinds of counterintuitive forms of recognition on behalf of unmaking uh, capitalism. Um, I'm gonna argue as well that collapse is a black aesthetic, and very specifically um, a black aesthetic. And if that sounds strange, I wanna start by um, proposing that collapse is part of, for example, black choreography. Um, if, you know, classical ballet, oriented by and often streamed through white bodies is about bodies trying to escape gravity, leaping gracefully through air. You could say that there are certain forms of black choreography that want to tether the body to the earth and bring the body down to the ground. Dancer and dance theorist Anna Martine Whitehead in an essay titled Expressing Life Through Loss or, and you can see the title here, on queens that fall with a freak technique, examines in her words, the relationship between blackness, queer vulnerability, and the mechanics of movement and dance. It, she suggests that 
um, Black Dance you, and her essay uses anecdotes to make an argument for downward movement and concaveness as movement techniques, responses to the physical threats intrinsic to Black ontologies. So there you have it. Why is collapse a Black aesthetic? Because it's a way of capturing aesthetically physical threats intrinsic to Black ontology. And think about all the images that we've seen in the last year of Black bodies being beaten to the ground by law enforcement. And you'll begin to um, understand what is meant here by physical threats intrinsic to Black ontology. So thinking about failing and falling and catastrophe as it emerges through the, the dancer's love-hate to gravity allows Whitehead to offer a theory of Black choreography. Just for a minute, I actually want to play you a clip uh, which doesn't have any um, words in it, so it won't require interpretation, but it's a clip of Bogus dancing in a nightclub. And what you're gonna see in the dance is exactly the demonstration of how Vogue, particularly in recent years, is built around what's called the death drop. And this is where the dancer in a Vogue context falls backwards onto their leg in a, a, a technique that is also sometimes called the suicide dip because it looks like the body is getting into a shape that it should not get into. It looks as if the, potentially the body will break by falling, but remarkably the dancers come right back up and keep falling and failing and falling and failing. So let's watch this just very quick clip. It, something that many of you will already know, but it gives us a reference point for the vocabulary of collapse. second here. All right. Okay, so now uh, Rachel Whitehead then um, proposes the following. And, and what she's doing here is linking queer of color aesthetics to impossibility, to the refusal of markability, um, and to the way in which the body dips and collapses back upon itself. Um, suggesting refusal and an embrace of a certain kind of devastation. So in this quote, um, she says, freedom is the moment you might have fallen, but have everyone convinced otherwise. We do not stop collapsing, okay? And in this essay, which I really recommend to people, she connects the fall of a woman from a slave ship to the Vogue suicide dip. So she's proposing that a set of gestures correspond to a history of black vulnerability and that those gestures pass not through the vocabulary of building, making, rising, but through the vocabulary of collapsing, falling, failing. Okay, so you can see that why one would make uh, a, um, a case here for a black aesthetics uh, of collapse. Okay, let's continue with this then by thinking about Alvin Baltrop and his photography. And so I want to introduce you to Baltrop for those of you who don't know um, his work uh, by opening with this image, which again, like the other one that I showed you is quite typical of his work. Um, you do have a male body in the frame for, you know, uh, to, to allow the human viewer to find themselves in the frame, but there's also a break in the wall and it's the break in the wall that really draws the viewer's attention in. The um, white male body is spray painting onto a wall. And if you look, you'll see that he is sort of carving a phallus um, out of the wall by painting black around it. So it's a kind of reverse silhouette. And then he stands under the frame, under the phallus, even as the building uh, upon which he paints is in a state of disorder and collapse. And it's that kind of tension 
that I believe his work explores a tension between triumphal masculinism, masculinism, which is invested in phallic power, in erection and erectability, potency and power, and another kind of aesthetic of collapse that is deeply embedded in a kind of impotence. Um, and it's that impotence that I think comes through in his work. Okay, and so here are some of the images from Alvin Baltrop's uh, uh, archive. So who was he? Alvin Baltrop was a um, black gay man. He served in Vietnam in the Marines in the 1970s, came back to New York City and uh, joined many other gay men cruising in the piers um, and creating uh, art, life, sex, uh, and, and, you know, other features of an alternative world in the collapsing and crumbling piers of New York City. I already told you why the piers were collapsing, but the other piece of this is that um, part of the West Side Highway that links the city to uh, the west uh, edge of the city where the Hudson River is had collapsed, I think in 1972. And this made the whole area of the piers off limits to the police therefore creating a kind of lawless zone where people could deal drugs, cruise, have sex, um, spend the night uh, or whatever without being interrupted by the police or arrested or any of those things. So Baltrop started visiting the piers and taking these fantastic, mostly black and white photographs of the piers and of uh, men cruising within them. We'll, the, we'll see a lot of images in Alvin Baltrop's uh, archive uh, that are of these large empty warehouse spaces that are no longer being used to uh, you know, hold materials, um, but have become blank slates for people writing and drawing on the walls. You, on some days you could go into the piers and find a David Wanarovich, David Wanarovich mural. You could find a Basquiat mural. Um, there were what was graffiti and then and all of these things can catch your eye as you're looking at this warehouse space and then again right in the center of the paint of the painting it looks very painterly it looks like a David Hockney in the middle of the photograph just caught by the light you see two men embracing and it, you'll see that this is the same scale that we saw in the last one the same scale that reduces human figuration to a tiny part of what's happening in the empty space of this um, empty warehouse, basically. So we're asked to look at space differently. The work is training us to see something in nothing, to see something in emptiness, to look for more than the human, to think about ecologies of water, light, steel, and flesh and not simply train our eyes on human contact, but understand that human contact and human erotics always unfold against vast ecologies of non-human material life. And I know that that is not necessarily what Alvin Baltrop would have said he was doing, but the archive that we have left does that work nonetheless. So here's another, um, here's an exterior. Um, by Bal Baltrop. And here, the bodies are not necessarily engaged in sex. And there's a lot of bodies that are just simply reclining together. There's a lot of congregation, a lot of images of collectivity, um, naked collectivity, we could call it, uh, you know, which is kind of interesting, right? Because you're looking at bodies that are naked, but are not naked simply to have sex. And so there's a sense of maybe a kind of openness, um, an unmasked quality, which is a word that is of interest to us now, um, and a way in which the men come to each other naked, um, as if the, the social mores have been cast aside, and Baltrop captures that as well. Here's again a very typical, uh, but beautiful, beautiful photograph. And, and the reason that I, I wanna show you this one is to say, yes, your visual pleasure can be trained upon the two men at the center of the photograph, obviously engaged in a blowjob. But in order to access that image, 
you have to also take in with your gaze the collapsed um, um, rafters, these, these massive pieces of steel that have fallen haphazardly around the men. And it makes the sex, you know, it, even though the, the bodies are small, it makes the sex grand in the ruins of this industrial uh, culture. So one of the things that I think Baltrop is doing is drawing out the beauty of collapse as opposed to the magnificence, let's say, of a finished structure. And he's training us to look differently at landscapes so that when we see collapse, we don't simply say, see disorder and tidiness, something that needs to be cleared away. We're actually looking at geometries. We're looking at forms and shapes that have been etched into the landscape by the building itself. You could almost say that the building is the architect here. We're looking also quite simply at gravity. So when I was started this project, and, and the project is very much about the 1970s, um, I thought, well, you know, in order to build my sort of utopian project, which is a, a project that has to go through dystopia, think about collapsing and failing and falling in order to say, we can find something better, but only if we unmake the world we are in. I realized that I was using a method that was very familiar to me already from the work of Jose Esteban Munoz. And this is how Munoz puts it. He says, my approach to hope as a critical methodology can be best described as a backward glance that enacts a future vision. My approach to hope as a critical methodology can best be described as a backward glance that enacts a future vision. That's exactly what we're doing. We're looking back to see how things were before the world that we live in now was built and before it was built up, gentrified, um, um, created in such a way as to exploit certain people, render other people homeless uh, and so on. So we're, uh, you know, we're going to look backwards in order uh, to move forwards. Munoz um, uh, was also interested in this archive of the peers, but he joined that archive of cruising in the peers to the downtown, downtown scene of New York City and the queer cultural production that happened here. And here was uh, some uh, an artist that he wrote about, Ray Johnson, who in this kind of queer refusal of the straight hippie events in New York City in the 60s that went under the name of Happenings, Ray Johnson, cleaving again to the narrative of collapse, put on shows that were called nothings, nothings. To oppose happenings, he put on nothings. So you would show up somewhere and nothing was going on and no one was performing. And there you were, you were at a nothing. And I think that these, uh, these anti-performative events are super interesting as part and parcel of an aesthetics of collapse. The events were according to Munoz, minimalist, he said, when, uh, when compared to, quote, the overabundance that was associated with happenings. Since overabundance is something that has gotten us into this particular mess that we're in in capitalism, the, the desire in capitalist societies to have everything and have it now, think Amazon, okay, work that cleaves to the minimalist should be of great interest to us uh, at this moment. But this is where I part ways with Munoz. Munoz continues in thinking about Ray Johnson's work. And he says, this performative insistence on the nothing, the not there over the presentness of the happening is both queer and utopian. He claims that the utopian orientation of the nothing lies in the way that it acknowledges the lack within heteronormative projections of reality and then inhabits the lack as nothing or ephemerality. But what I, but, but then he suggests that queer utopian practice is a response to that nothing. Queer utopian practice is a response to that nothing. And it is about building a world so that queerness is not allied with nothing. Now I reject that here and now, and I propose that queerness should build a politics of nothing. Queerness should build a politics of nothing and stay there in this minimalist non-space that it offers. Okay, and I'm gonna just move through, this, this is 
Jose Munoz's archive, and I'm not going to stay with it now, except to say that his archive is a confirmation of the the immensely provocative politics of nothing. He writes, for example, about Fred Harco, who was a dancer who re-performed Eve Klein's Leap into the Void from 1964. Eve Klein's Leap into the Void, as you can see here, was photoshopped. So it looked as if he was jumping out of a window and falling to the street, but of course he had a safety net to catch him. Fred Harco, on the other hand, who was a queer, kind of failed dancer in the downtown scene in the 1960s, in um, uh, at the end of the 60s, went over to, uh, no, in 1964, as his final performance, he went over to a friend's house on Cornelia Street and put on some music and did, in Jose Munoz's terms, a perfect jeté out of the window and fell to his death. So there's that falling again, that collapsing again, that is part and parcel of a queer aesthetic and that cannot be repaired by building and making but is something that we should stay with in terms of its refusal of capitalism and capitalist notions of time. Munoz, you know, acknowledges that the leap is anchored incandescent. He calls it incandescent. And I would argue that it is wild and part of something that we could call an anarchitectural queerness. And anarchitecture, and I'll say a little bit about that in a second, but anarchitecture was a movement in the 1970s pioneered by a Chilean immigrant, uh, Gordon Matt Clark, that sought literally to unbuild buildings, make cuts in them and bring them down or bring them to the point of collapse. Alvin Baltrop, as it turns out, took some of the most beautiful pictures of Gordon Matt Clark's and architectural cuts. And I'll show you some of those in a moment. So we just moved through a few more um, of Baltrop's images. These are now quite familiar, where you have to uh, um, reckon with the steel girder in order to approach the bodies of the gay men cruising. And as in many of the other images we've seen, these men are not having sex. <coughs> in fact, they're not even looking at each other here. They're, one is looking at the photographer, but they could also be engaged, if you like, with the building itself. So. This is why I'm claiming that there's a bigger erotics at stake here that isn't just a gay male erotics of two bodies having sex, but is a kind of erotic atmosphere that suffuses the space of the peers and that Baltrop's photographs capture. So here's one of the very few photographs that Baltrop actually gives a name to. Uh, and when he does give a name to the photograph, it's called collapsed architecture. No date, but probably 1975. So he was obviously deeply engaged with the materiality of collapse and his camera, whether or not he was looking for bodies when he his camera trained upon the, um, um, the these kinds of scenes, what his lens captured was in fact the aesthetic of collapse. This was the book that finally was put together of his work and, and look right in the center. There you can see two men having sex, one wearing a leather jacket, um, um, but the two bodies again are tiny against the backdrop of this massive structure seemingly collapsing onto itself and possibly collapsing onto the bodies themselves. Um, this is another image without gay men in it. And I think this is just so beautiful, the way that Baltrop's camera gets this angle on one of the piers that is jutting out into the Hudson and a, a through the motion of collapse, a really beautiful kind of fold has been built into the building itself. It's almost like a Frank Gehry structure. So fold is gonna have to enter our vocabulary as well. Um, folding, collapsing, failing, falling. This is the vocabulary we've developed so far. Just to round out and, and finish up with this section, um, very often when we see a gay body, as we did at the very beginning of my slideshow, the body is framed by the architecture. The body does not dominate the architecture. The architecture dominates the body. Um, the place is not built to keep out the elements. Very often we see windows that are not windows like these. They are there letting light in. They are not to keep the cold out because there's no glass in those windows. 
But if you look down, you'll see half the torso. So the camera is not that bothered about getting the whole body into the frame. If the body is there, so be it. But Baltrop is looking at other things. He's looking at the sagging frame of the window. He's looking at the way that the light streams in. And he's looking at the industrial landscape that we can see through the window. He's also looking at the reflection of light on water. In these images, there are bodies again, but we don't actually even know whether the bodies are awake or asleep, dead or alive. They are merely debris upon the floor alongside other debris. And in the, in the image on the right, you see this broken umbrella um, that is messing with our understanding of interior and exterior. It's a see-through umbrella, moreover, um, uh, that is broken at the stem and is open inside, right? And the sunlight's coming in, suggesting that, you know, there's not even any rain. So we have all of this sort of useless material on the floor. And among that useless material are human bodies. So Baltrop isn't drawn to the grandiosity of the human body. There's a way in which the human body doesn't matter to him. What matters to him is the set of relations that pertains to the structure, the light, and the flesh. Here's one um, the, on a weird slant where you see again the, the naked collectivity, men not having sex, men hanging out together in states of undress, but weirdly because of the angle, it seems as if this concrete platform is dipping into the water or potentially as if the bodies would slide into the water. So there's a kind of um, an, a skewed angle um, that makes it impossible for the viewer uh, to, you know, to, to see the image right side up, if you like. Here, and here finally, we see bodies having sex a little bit closer, um, but uh, as usual, there's a kind of um, uh, a concerto going on, a, 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 a whole symphony of things happening that are um, about the steel, the wood, the rotting wood and the water. Okay, so I'm trying to basically um, oppose this architecture uh, of collapse with um, the kind of material that the art market is desperately, you, you know, interested in now or cleaves to, wants to buy, right? So people like Alvin Baltrop uh, and certainly people like Gordon Matter Clark, the an architecture guy, didn't care about the art market. In fact, recognized how ruinous the art market would be for art. And they made work that could not be collected because it was, it was, you know, the an architecture, for example, would simply eventually erode and disappear. And Baltrop's photographs were not being shown and were not ever sold to an art market. This, however, is Jeff Koons. And I'm using Jeff Koons pneumatic inflatables as a kind of counter image for the aesthetics of collapse. This is the aesthetics of erection. This is the aesthetics of inflation. These um, balloon puppies can be found outside many, many museums around the world. They sell for millions of dollars and they trade in the fantasy of an inflated masculinity that is always erect, always ready, uh, and that never, ever falls down. In contrast to that, Baltrop captures the disintegration of property, the dereliction of architecture, and the anarchitectural process of ruination. And these are the kinds of phallic architectures that Baltrop's um, uh, work is in opposition to. Um, we've seen, in, yeah, okay. So we're gonna move on now to dereliction and I'll just, I'll do this quickly so that we can uh, conclude by about eight o'clock and have time for questions. So destitution. I'm using destitution here, quoting from the Invisible Committee, who say it is only from the destituent standpoint that one can grasp all that is incredibly constructive in the breakage. And I won't go into this too much now, but the Invisible Committee are an anarchist group in France who argue in their latest manifesto for destituting institutions. Okay, um, destitution is a topic taken up by a black. Um, artist, Cameron Rowland, a recent MacArthur Fellowship recipient. And um, this work, I believe, is very much in conversation with both Gordon Matt Clark and Alvin Baltrop. And so I, I want to just tell you about this piece from uh, 2018. Um, 
uh, and well, I'll get to the magic clock in a moment. So what Cameron Rowland did in 2018 is he bought an acre of land on Adisto Island in South Carolina, a place that had been formerly a slave plantation. Uh, and he bought this piece of land in order to withdraw it from the market and to also comment on the failed promises of the Emancipation Proclamation that promised former slaves 40 acres and a mule. Okay, a promise that was broken, that land that was never given, livestock that was never provided, uh, resources that were never assigned so that former slaves never could enter into an economy that was built upon their labor. Given that, Cameron Rowland's project is to depreciate land, okay, depreciate land. So he buys this acre of land in South Carolina, he withdraws it from the market um, um, economy. How does he do that? He built nothing on it. He grew nothing on it. He did nothing on it. And over the course of a year or two, the land lost all value. And he waited until it reached the point of zero, and then the project is finished. And you can see that there is no visual pleasure in the project, right? He shows you the documents that, in, that are pertaining to the purchase of the land, and he gives you some schematics of the land, but he's denying you visual pleasure and he's denying the art market a sale. And at the same time, he is draining land of value. In this respect, he's quoting the work from the 70s um, by... Gordon Matter Clark. And you can't see it in this particular piece, but in um, one of Gordon Matter Clark's um, uh, an architectural pieces, he bought little uh, pieces of land from New York City. They were called gutter, uh, gutter estates, I believe. And they're little bits of pieces of land that nobody owns, you know, nothing that you could even live on, just a little tiny parcel of land. And he bought something like 13 of them for $25 a piece in order to demonstrate how we should be buying land, pulling it away from the possessive investment in building and owning and marketing and so on, um, and made a kind of um, commentary on uh, draining land and real estate markets of their value. The piece was called Fake Estates to draw attention to the speculative nature of the real estate market. Okay, so, um, and this, this work, I wanna to move to now by Gordon Matter Clark, and this sort of brings everything together for us, the, the, the peers as photographed by um, Gordon Baltrop, the depreciation of land, the refusal to make art for the art market. This piece is called Nothing Works. And in that sense, it repeats the, these nothings of Ray Johnson's, right, that we talked about a minute ago. Uh, well, actually, this isn't called Nothing Works. I'm sorry. This is a, a quotation by Gordon Matt Clark, who said in 1972, nothing works. And that was one of his mottos. This piece is called Day's End. This is photographed by Alvin Baltrop. And Alvin Baltrop was one of the best photographers of Gordon Matt Clark's work. Gordon Matt Clark made Day's End in, uh, I think, 1973, he cut a series of semicircles into Pier 52 that allowed light to stream in. And then he made cuts into the floor of the building that allowed the light that was streaming in to hit the water and then bounce up and reflect, refract off the walls. And in that sense, he created what he called a cathedral or temple effect within the dark warehouse space where the gay men were cruising, the drug dealers were dealing, the dispossessed were living um, and so on. So um, here we have a kind of collaboration, if you like, between Baltrop's camera and Matter Clark's uh, cuts. So why, you know, why focus on the cut? Why focus on the warehouse? Why not focus on gay male cruising? And here's, an, just before we get to that, here's one more image by Alvin Baltrop of Day's End. There's the one of the main cuts that allows for both light and water to enter into the space of the warehouse. Um, this is David Hammond's piece that just went up this week across the Whitney where Gordon Matter Clark's um, Day's End uh, stood. Uh, on the same spot, David Hammond's produced an homage to 
uh, day's end. And the reason that I think this is so interesting is because nowadays, nowadays, gay men don't cruise in the way that they did in the piers. Nowadays, we just have Grindr. And Grindr has figured out how to monetize gay male cruising. So what was an activity in the piers, in the ruins, within this collapsing environment that was about uh, not just about sex, but about what I called naked collectivity has now been, uh, um, you know, scooped up by an algorithm and turned into a multi-billion dollar global uh, corporate uh, activity in which gay men find each other online and the online interests are able to capitalize on this activity. So for those reasons, we should be paying mo way more attention to the architecture than the male bodies. Okay, so I want to end this piece and then uh, move, offer you an, a conclusion. Everything that I've told you about so far in relation to the peers has been about men, men cruising, men dealing, men making, men photographing. So uh, as it turns out, in, um, in 1979, the peers were all still there. Um, Matt O'Clock was already dead. He died very young of um, cancer. Um, Baltrops uh, had stopped making photographs or at least was had not shown the photographs. Um, um, in 1979, a girls punk queer film was released called Times Square, part of which was filmed in the piers. Okay. And this is a beautiful, another beautiful way of thinking about collapse, but this time in relationship to a kind of feminist aesthetic in which the um, uh, the dangerous New York City of the 1970s is not seen as a battleground for young girls, but is in fact seen as a, pl a place that is safer for them than the family home. So let me give you the spot and then I, uh, the, the, the plot of the film, and then I'm going to just show you a beautiful clip from the film, filmed in the piers. So Times Square uh, is a film about two girls on the run. Uh, Nikki and Pammy. Pammy is a little rich girl whose father is a real estate developer in Manhattan and who wants to pull down places like the piers and uh, build up luxury real estate. Nikki, who you see here, is a butch runaway. And Nikki and Pammy meet when they're both assigned to a, a psych ward in, a, in a Bellevue. Uh, they join forces um, and to the soundtrack of I want to be sedated by the Ramones, they escape from the mental institution and take off into the city and make their way to Times Square. In Times Square, again, rather than being, you know, two girls who are vulnerable to the pimps and the hookers, they make common cause with the pimps and the hookers in Times Square. They dance in clubs. They uh, go to um, B movies. Uh, um, and they make a home for themselves in the piers. And exactly uh, right here, Pier 56, very close to where Baltrop was photographing, very, very close to where Gordon Matt Clark was making his cuts. They, they go to the piers and they find a little room in the piers and they salvage furniture and make a little place for themselves. The, this scene, however, is where Nikki tries to share a vision with Pammy about their utopian life, separate from parents, separate from social services, separate from everyone who wants to save them from the streets. Um, Nikki proposes that in order, in order to build, you know, to, to make common cause with the collapsing uh, peers all around them, they have to have a friendship bond that is unshakable. And this is the scene. <laughs> Bad boy. Come on, babe. Let me see. What did I realize it before? God, it's like, wait to see it. Don't you realize this is? This is the place. Show you, watch this. Hey, look, that can be yours. <laughs> 
Come on, don't worry, I ain't gonna hurt you, just relax. That's all. Nah, I want you to listen to me. You ever feel like freaking? You get panicky, shaky? I want you to call my name. Just scream it. Scream it as loud as you can. You know, like this. Pammy! Pammy! Nikki! Hold on. Nikki! Pammy! Nikki! Pammy! I love that scene. It's it's really gorgeous. The, the film just, by the way, was uh, a failure, uh, which is perhaps befitting for the topic of this talk. Um, it got horrible reviews um, and um, did not circulate widely. But it, it is a cult classic at this point. I think many people have recognized its cinematic value. Uh, one of the reasons that it did poorly um, was, you know, because people could not imagine this story about two girls on the run. Um, the director abandoned the film at a certain point after the studio decided to um, censor a lesbian sex scene, so the, the, the scene was cut out. I think that that was premature because in many ways this is the lesbian sex scene. This is a scene within which two young girls scream each other's names and allow those names to take up space in the empty buildings and there you can you know again see this ecology of ruination that because the the piers are empty because they're in a state of collapse the the the, the shouting echoes through them it becomes a kind of beautiful um a, a acoustic space um and it's a a way of seeing two girls remaking uh, the world uh, by saying, I will recognize you, you will recognize me. We don't need this external world. All right. I'm not going to do this section, sadly, but if you are interested, I can tell you about the sonic chaos of Pauline Oliveros, who um, uh, basically created absolutely, um, uh, you know, eclectic, completely unique uh, sound systems um, by pulling away from harmony and leaning into uh, sonic chaos. But I'm going to end today by trying to pull together the material that I've presented so far by returning to the quote with which we began. Those who build walls are their own prisoners. I'm going to fulfill my proper function in the social organism. I'm going to unbuild walls. Now that we've seen the photographs by Alvin Baltrop of the collapsing piers, we've watched those images from Vogue balls where the black dancers collapse in a suicide dip back on their, their legs, forming a kind of black choreography of collapse. We've looked at some of Gordon Matt Clark's uh, work, his cuts, into the buildings that bring buildings to the point of collapse. Now, maybe we are ready to think about why we would want to unbuild walls, as Shevik says in The Dispossessed. So here it is. This was a science fiction classic of the 1970s. It's called The Dispossessed. Um, and in it, Ursula Le Guin, as I said, tells a story of a physicist named Shevik. Shevik lives uh, in a, on an anarchist planet called um, Anuris and um, has discovered, using um, his scientific research, a theory of simultaneity. He has discovered a theory of simultaneity. This is so promising of a scientific um, discovery that the capitalist planet, Eurus, has invited him to come and share his, his work with them. So off he goes, he goes on a spaceship to something that's a bit like Earth, a capitalist um, um, planet. He shares his work and he gets very seduced by the capitalist lifestyle. He's seduced that he, by the fact that he has his own room. He can drink, he eats whatever he wants. He has ownership of his intellectual labor. Unlike in his home on the anarchist planet, he does not have to do manual labor as well. He can just be an intellectual uh, and he's, he settles in. And then at a certain point, halfway through the novel, he begins to see the capitalist world differently. He sees how empty it is. 
he sees how superficial it is. He, he gets horribly drunk. He becomes sick. Um, he has no real connections with anyone. And he sees how oppressed people are on the capitalist planet. At that moment, a, an underground um, resistance movement reaches out to him. They ask him to meet them in the public square and to give a speech. He agrees. He goes to meet with the um, revolutionary group and he gives the following speech. So he says, we know that there is no help for us, but from one another. That no hand will save us if we do not reach out our hand. And that the hand you reach out as is, is as empty as mine is. You have nothing. You possess nothing. You own nothing. You are free. All you have is what you are and what you give. And with that, he disappears into the underground resistance movement and finally uh, leaves Earth. So this speech is really beautiful, right? And it it brings to a conclusion um, some of the, the 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 key terms that I've been working with and some of the key ideas that I've been trying to uh, develop. So he says that we know that there is no help for us but from one another, and that's the kind of naked collectivity that I was referencing in the peers. He says that no hand will save us if we do not reach out our hand. So there's a kind of mutuality, an anarchist mutuality uh, that is to be the, the foundation upon which the, the new society will be built. And then, and this is where we now begin to connect to the nothing, the collapse, the emptiness. He says, the hand you reach out is as empty as mine is. You have nothing. Think here, Cameron Rowland's work. You possess nothing. You own nothing you are free. So this is a, a beautiful kind of anarchist statement, if you like, of what I will call empty handedness, empty handedness, the only way to counteract the gross uh, overabundance that capitalism has built into the system for the many at the expense of the few is to refuse ownership, refuse something and happenings, propulsion, and building and making, and instead embrace nothing and understand that only when you possess nothing and you own nothing, you will be free. Thank you.